Yeah, I'm going to uh, talk to you more about uh, diversification rate estimation. I'm not exactly sure. I think the first session will, or the first lecture presentation, will take a little bit longer than planned, but the second one after the time for the coffee break will be a little bit shorter. So you will just have more time in the morning than to go through the two or three different tutorials, depending on how far you're getting. Um, that is the plan for the morning. Um, and then Anna, Emma will continue, and I hope that will fit quite well in uh, what I'm ending with, uh, also on diversification rate estimation and uh, biogeography. The general idea is that uh, now, yesterday, you estimated your time calibrated phylogeny. And today, once you have that time calibrated phylogeny, what can we do with it? And one of the things that we can do with it, we can estimate diversification rates. That doesn't mean that in RefBase, in principle, it shouldn't be possible to actually do all of this jointly or so. Just from the flow of the lectures, it's easier to teach that as consecutive steps in your analysis pipeline. So the motivation that uh, I always put out for diversification rate estimations is that there's quite a lot of different patterns um, of, uh, for example, like adaptive radiation of these Hawaiian Silversworth when they are coming originally like from the West Coast and then uh, colonized Hawaii and started rapidly uh, diversifying. If we build a time calibrated phylogeny of this, we're actually seeing quite well that there was a rapid radiation. But we actually, our task here is that we actually want to build a statistical model that we can identify and find if there was an adaptive radiation. Another thing that we are really interested in is um, finding if there were key innovations that were leading to rapid radiations, or if there's any other characters that we have that are correlated with diversification rates, and then leading here, for example, like in the next disperse of columbines, leading to a high rate of speciation, or on the other side could have led to a more higher rate of extinction. So that we have, depending on the character, the key innovation, if we find that, seeing if that is driving our diversification. Um, another large topic that we are not quite covering that much in RefBase is uh, diversity-dependent diversification. That basically means once you have an adaptive radiation, it, uh, you really start to diversify a lot until the, the capacity of the niche is filled and then you have a higher extinction rate or lower speciation rate, which virtually means that the net diversification rate uh, gets really low, goes towards zero, and uh, the amount of species in that group stabilizes. We are not doing that much in RefBase because we just use the proxy of diversification rates through time. So if we see that they go down, the net diversification rate through time goes down, that is sort of our proxy to see, yes, that looks like diversity-dependent um, diversification. The next thing that I've been working on a lot is also on um, estimating mass extinction event from time calibrated phylogenies. So actually if we only have um, our X10 taxa, we are still actually able and uh, we might be interested for some of the groups looking if we see a signal just also in the DNA sequences um, from the mass extinction event. So for the outline, this, the first part I will talk mostly about constant diversification rates and then diversification rates through time. And then I will, um, after the break in the morning, I will talk about these last two parts, about the branch-specific diversification rates, and just uh, start a little bit going into character-dependent diversification rates, because that really fits into those two topics. The overall goal of what I've been doing with this is that we actually would like to have a framework where we can analyze that diversification rates have changed through time. For example, that could be correlated by some environmental factors. And when we want to test for that, diversification rates could have changed along the lineages of our phylogeny. And some of these changes could be character dependent. And so far, we all do all of these things stepwise. So these are already possible to do in RefBase. 
but the really nice thing that we are trying to work towards in the next years is to have one unifying framework where you're actually trying all of this together to try to look for the competing hypothesis if your diversification rates are more driven by those abiotic factors or more by biotic factors. So these are the motivations and ideas what we are working on. Just as a really brief history of uh, the uh, birth death process that is used for estimating diversification rates. So in 1924, Ewell developed um, the, what is now often called the Ewell process, but actually he also worked on birth and death processes. But he was more looking at uh, the number of species that you're expecting on a, uh, yeah, on a birth death process for a given time. So that was already done in uh, 1924. And then in 1948, uh, 48 and 49, Kendall developed all of the equations that are now fundamental to the, uh, to the probability distribution of the number of species that we are observing at a given time. Uh, so those were the fundamental papers. And the, the first paper or book chapter by Thompson in 1975 was when this was applied to a phylogenetic tree. So where the data or the observation was assumed to be the phylogenetic tree and we compute the probability of observing that phylogenetic tree, just that reconstructed tree actually without the extinct lineages, um, uh, yeah, under a birth death process. And then a lot of the methods that we're using nowadays really builds on this paper by Neat Alf in 1994, when he really describes the reconstructed process, which is the a phylogenetic tree without extinct lineages. And a lot of these models that we are using are basically extensions of this underlying paper and framework that was developed uh, more than 20 years ago now. So to give you an idea, we start always at the origin with one species, then we can have speciation events, we can have extinction events, more speciation events, more extinction events. So this really shows you um, just um, yeah, a realization of the process, of the birth death process. And this is then the complete tree. And on a birth death model, what we are assuming is you start with your lineage, at, or with our origin, with one lineage, and you have an exponential distributed waiting time until an event happens. So with the speciation rate, you have the exponential waiting time until a speciation event happens. And the same for the extinction event, you have an exponential distributed waiting time that the extinction event happens. And these are then applied to all the species at the same way, so that they're independently evolving. But usually, we assume that they all have exactly the same speciation and extinction rates. So then, in this complete tree, we always have these extinct lineages. And these are extinct lineages, if we don't have a really good fossil record and use the fossilized birth death process that Tracy talked about yesterday, we don't actually observe those. So we just prune them away. So if you see here before, these were the, the extinct lineages. We just prune them away. And this is when we then call the reconstructed tree, because that's reconstructed from our present day extant taxa. So just as a summary of this, the idea behind the birth death process is we have the complete tree. Time goes from the top to the bottom. Here's the reconstructed tree. A species always gives birth to exactly one species. So in these processes, we always assume that it's a bifurcating process that results into binary trees. So to one new species with the right lambda, and I put in here that lambda could be a function of time, but it could be also be a function of the lineage or a character. Then a species dies with the right mu, so that is similar to giving birth. And only extant species in these examples can be observed or sampled. So we don't actually sample all of the species that are alive today. As a really simple graphical model, we have that our data in these examples is actually the time tree. Not like in the days before when we said the data are the sequences. So here we are really treating the data as a random variable drawn from this birth death process, but that is the data that we are attaching and assume we observe actually a phylogenetic tree. Then we have the root age as a fixed parameter of the process. 
Here we have a, a fixed speciation rate and a fixed sampling probability. So this is the simplest model, a pure birth model, where we actually don't have any free parameter. We would just compute the probability and that's it. So as the graphical model then really provides us the possibility to extend that one to a, um, estimate some parameters, we can say we have a prior distribution on the speciation rate and for example we use a uniform distribution or log normal distribution or gamma distribution whatever dist prior distribution you think fits well you uh, specify the prior on the speciation rate and in the simplest model that is when you would estimate uh, the speciation rate the constant speciation rate for your observed phylogeny. If you want to extend that a little bit to a birth death process and uh, here also in the simplest case, we have the fixed root age that is constant, a fixed speciation rate, fixed extinction rate, and a fixed sampling probability. So again, there's no free parameters in this model, but this is the simplest birth and death model. So if we then uh, extend it a little bit to specify um, prior distribution, similar to what Tracy showed yesterday, is that we, for example, can have a prior distribution on the diversification rate, a prior distribution on the turnover rate, and then we do parameter transformations because once we have the diversification rate and the turnover rate, we can then just deterministically compute what the speciation and extinction rates are, and then we estimate the uh, yeah we estimate those parameters, compute the probability of the observed time tree. So. There are quite a lot of different ways how we then can specify prior distribution and on our parameters or different ways that we can use parametrizations of this constant rate birth death process. <laughs> the first one is where we just have sort of the standard parameters, the speciation rate and extinction rate, and we directly specify parameters on it. The second one is that we have a speciation or the, the net diversification rate with a speciation minus extinction and the turnover rate. So that, uh, the turnover rate really means that it's a rate that a species is replaced by a new species. Then we can have the net diversification rate and the relative extinction rate as a parameterization, or we could have the speciation rate and the relative extinction rates. So those are the four most common parameterizations that you might see. And for the different advantages or dis the advantages, the first one, that's the natural parametrization because these are usually the parameters that you're interested in, the speciation and the extinction rates. Um, the problem with that is that you might specify actually an extinction rate that is larger than the speciation rate or you have a prior probability that the extinction rate is larger than the speciation rate. This might be something that you do want to have or this might be something that you don't want to have. And um, what I have observed is, for example, if you condition in your analysis that the tree that you was generated survived and you're seeing that tree, then estimating speciation and extinction rate, um, where the extinction rate is very large, you might tend to overestimate the extinction rate because you're conditioned on survival of that process. So it, uh, it's a little bit difficult in some of these ways um, to specify good priors directly on it. Additionally, if you use the speciation and extinction rate, it is often difficult to, uh, to estimate those parameters in your MCMC, which means it's difficult to get good mixing in your um, MCMC analysis because the speciation rate and the extinction rates are very highly correlated. So if you go to new parameter values of the speciation rate that are larger, you also want to go to uh, new extinction rates that are larger, and you want to jointly update those at the same time. But unfortunately, they are not like perfectly correlated, or not, there's no easy linear correlation between them. But just by a sort of experience, I can tell you that using these parameters, you, you have problems with the MCMC, and you need to diagnose if you got good convergence or not. The second parameterization was using the net diversification rate and the turnover rate, so where we have a good prior information actually about the net diversification rate. And the prior information that we can use is that the expectation of the net diversification rate is the logarithm of the number of species at present divided by two, if we started with two lineages, so with a root of our tree, divided by the total age of the tree. 
this gives us actually the, the, the expectation and we can center our prior distribution on, on that expectation and um, use that for getting a good prior um, yeah, that centers our value. Then the extinction rate in this sense is always, uh, can be forced to be always smaller than the speciation rate because um, if we have a net diversification rate that is positive, that means that the speciation rate must be larger than the extinction rate. Otherwise, our difference here wouldn't be positive. Um, and we have a biological interpretation of the turnover rate because that means how quickly one species is replaced by another species. Yes? When you talk total age, is it the, the, the tree or the root? Yes. The total age of the tree is the root age, so just the time of the entire process. I guess in other scenarios, if you would work with the origin of the tree, that would be the age of the origin, and then you wouldn't divide it by two, just by one. But yes. Um, the third parameterization is where you have basically the same net diversification rate, but then you're using the relative extinction rate. And I think that is the one that Tracy described yesterday in her lecture, um, which has also a good prior information because it's the exact same one as the one that I just showed before. And it's, um, the extinction rate, again, can be enforced to be smaller than uh, the speciation rate, especially if we are saying that the relative extinction rate is between zero and one. Um, it's a simple prior then on the uh, yeah, relative extinction rate because we could use either a uniform distribution or a beta distribution to say it's between zero and one. Um, with a beta distribution, again, we could put more prior that it's actually a high um, relative extinction rate or relatively low one. But, um, I did a little bit theoretical work on it that sometimes you get weird induced priors on the parameters, the speciation and extinction rates that you are estimating. So these are also examples that are, would be really good when you run your analysis under the prior to actually see how are the induced priors on my parameters looking. Um, and you could do that quite easily in RefBase, which is also one of the tasks um, in one of the first tutorials. Um, and the final one is when you actually have a um, prior on this or use the speciation rate and the relative extinction rate, um, where you can also enforce that the um, speciation rate must be larger than the speciation rate because you say that the relative extinction rate is between zero and one. So you have a simple prior, but then you don't really know what prior to uh, specify for the speciation rate. Because if you have a very high relative extinction rate, then the net diversification rate gets really small. So somehow you need to take that into account. So that also provides you a little bit of problems. But uh, yeah, so all of these different ways how to specify priors or parameters, they're all kind of easy and ref-based because you can all do all these easy parameter transformation. You have all these possibilities, but there's just different, yeah, they, they have different advantages and disadvantages. And sometimes it's just good to test a little bit what you're actually interested in if you're interested in the, in the net diversification rate or speciation rate, um, and so on. Okay. So then let's look at uh, estimating diversification rates through time. So the model that we're using here is that rate increases or decreases are either gradual or episodic, which means that, uh, for example, the, the standard process is that here would be a constant rate process, in this one, we have a period of uh, constant speciation and extinction rate. Then there's a shift, an abrupt shift in the extinction rate for another period of time. Then here's another shift in the extinction rate. Here we have a shift in the speciation rate and another shift in the speciation rate. Um, here, we would say here we actually had a mass extinction event in this example. And here's where we have speciation rate shift uh, extinction rate shifts and uh, a mass extinction event. And the, the underlying model is that we are really saying that uh, speciation rates and extinction rates are constant through, uh, through a certain, through our episode and just change at the end of the episode. So one of the examples that was given for that was um, uh, of the mammalian phylogeny by Meredith et al. Um, where we have a really nice, large, uh, time-calibrated phylogeny. And um, they looked then here at 
where speciation rate and extinction rate change, especially to look at uh, seeing if uh, speciation rates uh, changes are correlated with uh, the uh, falling to the mass uh, to the KPG mass extinction event. But here you see that the speciation rates went up around 80 million years ago and then down later on. So depending on the input phylogeny, you might actually be able to see that something on uh, at the times when you're expecting diversification rates uh, to change that actually happens. But if your phylogeny is a little bit too old, then you also get uh, rate changes that are not quite fitting with your prior assumptions. Um, and a lot of the theory that we are using builds uh, on the work that Tanya Stadler did, because she was the first one to actually show that we can use um, an analytical solution for the likelihood function, or for the probability of our time tree, by saying that when we, when we use that episodic process, we don't need to use numerical integration, and then we have a speciation and extinction rates that are constant through time, and then we have these abrupt shifts. And she also applied it to the mammalian phylogeny, but she found that there were these rate shifts that happened around uh, uh, 30 million years ago. And uh, this is also kind of interesting with the other examples I've been working on, when you see that uh, the mammalian diversification really started to increase, so had a higher diversification rate for a short time around 30 million years ago, where um, a lot in, um, in the forests and grasslands started to change at that time, so the environments, the biomes changed. Um, here you can see a different approach how to estimate um, uh, yeah, uh, diversification rates through time is when you actually a priori specify that you have these time bins and then you're trying to estimate the diversification rates in these time bins. So you are not really trying to estimate when speciation or extinction rates change when those shifts happen, but instead just saying, well, they're just equal distant epochs and uh, then you see what the curve through time looks like. This is also an idea that we are using in our tutorials. So um, the, the work that I've been recently doing is we assume that we have that episodic birth death process and then once we, uh, we try to estimate that the speciation rate and the extinction rate um, change episodically like that then um, we want to try to see, uh, or we, we estimated first the speciation rates through time um, and the extinction rates through time, and we want to see if the speciation rate or the extinction rate is actually correlated to environmental factor. And the phylogeny that we used for this is a daisy phylogeny, so a very large super tree, and we also used the grass phylogeny, so with a lot of different, uh, yeah, with over 2,000 species in that phylogeny. Um, yeah, that is the phylogeny. Um, so the, the daisy phylogeny has more than 23,000 species in total, um, and, but there are very few fossils known, and um, they started to really diversify a lot around 20 to 25 million years ago. And this is the phylogeny that we wanted to use to, um, to test if daisies or the diversification of daisies are, cor are correlated to a CO2. Um, one of the problems that we have with that phylogeny is that there are only about 10% of the species included in that phylogeny, so just a really uh, small number, a small fraction, even though it's still a large number of species in that tree. So what do we do with that? Um, we can incorporate incomplete taxon sampling. We had in the, f when I started talking about this, we have that this is here, our complete phylogeny. And uh, then here we have the reconstructed phylogeny where I'm just pruning out all the extinct lineages. Then I can also say we have a uniform sampling of our taxa by saying if I would flip a coin for every species and if it lands on hats, I'm going to include that species. If it lands on tail, I'm going to exclude that species. So this is what the uniform taxon sampling says. We call it uniform taxon sampling because it has a uniform probability for every species to be included. And you can probably, yeah. What kind of other samples? I will go to that in a second. Um, so each taxon has the same probability to be included. Um, 
We also have um, diversified taxon sampling, where we would say that all species are included um, that originated before a certain time. For example, that is motivated if we include one species per family or one species per genus. Although this is a quite strict mathematical model, if you have a family that is very young versus a family that would be very old, that is not quite captured in here. It's, it's really just saying we take species, we uh, take uh, just the line here and take them one species out of this group, one species for this group, for this one, one, and then actually two of these because the line we drew was up here. Um, but that is the mathematical the, the definition so that we can actually work or relax the assumption. Um, we are currently also working on mixture models between those two that you can actually try to do something intermediate where it's partially uniform and partially diversified sampling. Um, why that is really important also for estimating speciation and extinction rates is if you see this line here, that is uh, the estimated relative extinction rate under diversified sampling. And this is the, the estimates for uniform taxon sampling. And here you have the sampling fraction. So if you don't incorporate your sampling properly, um, that means that you're really underestimating the extinction rate. So if you're assuming um, that the generated tree was done on a uniform taxon sampling, but in reality it was diversified taxon sampling, you always get much lower extinction rates. Um, it could be vice versa as well. So if the true sampling was ra a uniform taxon sampling, but you use a diversified taxon sampling method, then you get to high extinction rates. But I think that the tendency is always we assume uniform, but it's not uniform. So when we applied um, the uniform taxon sampling to that large daisy phylogeny, these were the speciation rates and the extinction rates that we're getting. So not really much changes. We saw that there's a slight peak here, or a slight increase in the speciation rates about 20 million years ago. But uh, you also see here that these are the 95% credible intervals. So that basically could be just a concentrate process. We don't really get any signal when I assume every species had a sampling probability of 10%. And that was the same for all the species. But what we actually know also from the daisy phylogeny is uh, how many species are belonging to every single of these families. So if they are belonging to this family, we also know when those missing speciation events must have happened. So we can use that additional information. So for example, if we know that there's n taxa missing in, in this group, we can say this group is that old if that is the relative time of the entire tree. And um, then we know that uh, n speciation events must have happened in this time interval. And uh, this is then the curve that, that we're using, the likelihood curve um, for the speciation and extinction rate. That means this curve will be pushed to a higher extinction rate because more recent, if uh, we are missing a lot of more recent speciation events, it's more likely that um, there was also a higher extinction rate. So actually, all these missing speciation events, if we can sort of bin them and know in which time interval they happen, they actually have a lot of information about uh, the timing or the, the change in diversification rates. So if we apply then this, what I call the empirical taxon sampling, because we empirically use that information to which groups they belong, we are actually getting that the speciation rate shifts here, and we get a strong decrease in the extinction rate at a different time. So that is really informing our estimates. So if we then, um, uh, yeah, we applied it then to the speciation rate, uh, and ex I think this, yeah, it's a net diversification rates that we are seeing. We are seeing this here on the yellow line for the daisies and the uh, red line that's for the, for the grasses. And the, what is black or dark green here, that is the inferred um, CO2, the carbon dioxide through time. And you see that there's a shift of the net diversification rate in daisies and grasses that is going up exactly around that time here. 
and there's the, then the shift of the CO2 that is going down here. So that was our hypothesis or our motivation then saying they might be actually negatively correlated. So when the CO2 is going down, the net diversification rates in grasses is going up when um, all these forest landscapes are changing to more grass landscapes. Um, the model that we developed for this is that we set the speciation rate is uh, like a regression function, so it's equal to the uh, background speciation rate times beta, so that's our correlation efficient, times the, um, uh, yeah, times um, uh, the CO2 that we have, so that's the reg regression slope, and then we add some residuals or some error, where we are saying that the speciation and extinction rates can actually vary through time independently of, our, of the CO2 as well. That we are not saying that all the, the rate changes through time are forced by the CO2. So when we are applying this, we see for the speciation rate that we are estimating a quite negative um, slope for the, um, yeah, for the regression. And we see that um, the zero value basically falls out almost on the tail. It's not quite strong in this example, but it's a, it's a strong uh, posterior probability that we have a negative speciation rate. Um, it's much, much larger for the extinction rate. So here, the zero value, that is your null hypothesis, that they're uncorrelated, um, is not even on that plot. So we, we see even stronger that they have a very strong negative effect on the um, extinction rate. So how do we do that model then finally in RefBase? It's very similar, actually, to the models uh, that I described before to the concentrate models, but instead of saying that there's just a single speciation rate and a single extinction rate, we just take a vector of speciation rates and extinction rates. And these vectors, it's one speciation rate per time interval, and uh, this is all we need if we wanted to say the speciation rates and extinction rates would be fixed. But because we want to actually estimate the speciation and extinction rates, we say and that we specify a prior distribution. And in this example, what, what I'm doing here is that I'm specifying an autocorrelated model of speciation rates through time. So I have a standard deviation of the diversification rate, and a, or the speciation rate, and a standard deviation of the turnover rate or extinction rates then. So, and then I start with a prior distribution, which this is, he just hidden in this example. I start with a prior distribution at the present, and then I'm going backwards time by time and saying uh, that diversification rates are autocorrelated. So that means the diversification rate at the I plus ones interval depends or is centered on the diversification rate on the previous interval. So basically what I'm doing is I use Brownian motion to specify how diversification rates change through time. And I'm doing exactly the same thing for the turnover rates, and then I'm doing my parameter transformation to go from the diversification rates and turnover rates to speciation and extinction rates through time, and use or uh, estimate these parameters, computing the probability of the time tree. Um, finally, just some words about estimating mass extinction events. So we know that uh, mass extinction events are actually very short periods of time with a very high extinction rate. And we, we s usually say that 50 to uh, yeah, 75 percent of the genera go extinct and 90 percent of the species diversity is lost. So we could um, either model that by a very short time interval where, uh, where we have a shift that goes to very high extinction rate and then a shift that goes to back to the standard uh, extinction rate. Or we can use actually an explicit model where we have mass extinction events as uh, where every species has a given survival probability. And uh, if we use that explicit model and we specify informative priors that we can biologically motivate, for example, we can use a beta prior distribution on the survival probability of a species of a mass extinction event. And as I said before, the survival probability of a mass extinction event is around like 0.05 or 0.1, because if the survival probability of a mass extinction event would be like 90%, I wouldn't really call it a mass extinction event. This is just a normal extinction. So that's why 
by the definition of a mass extinction event, I can put these strongly motivated biological priors on what a survival probability is. And in that sense, I can actually separate out if that were rate shifts, the standard rate shifts through time, or if that is a mass extinction event with a given survival probability. And we also applied this um, to the inference of a mass extinction in conifers, and then we uh, tested if there's a strong support, so we computed base factors um, for if there are these different mass extinction events. And uh, here you see that twice the logarithm of the base factor, um, we have the lines here, and it's 2, 6, or 10. So if it's 2, there's basically no support. If it's 6, there's between this one, there's, uh, there's small support. If it's here, it's more stronger support. And we see that there's two possible mass extinction events, but there's not strong support. But there's one mass extinction event around uh, 23 million years ago, where we have a lot of like a very strong support that this happened in the conifers. And what is actually really nice, if we put those two studies that we have been working on together, is we see that there was this um, increase in diversification in the daisies and the grasses, basically at the same time when there was this mass extinction event of the conifers. So when all the trees went away, there was space for grasses and daisies to just uh, invade all that landscape and start to diversify in different patches. So something really must have happened at this time. There was also a um, big volcanic uh, eruption at that uh, point in time. So there's a lot of evidence showing that it wasn't really like a major mass extinction, but it was a big change in the landscapes that we see it. Also, the grazers that we have with a the little donkey there on top, they really started to diversify much more rapidly around that time. So this is what we can do if we just look at estimating diversification rates through time. We can estimate if, if they change through time, we can estimate if they're correlated to environmental factors, and we can look at mass extinction events. Yes? Yeah. But sometimes you have one hundred bar at the same point. You should consider that one uh, event or multiple events at the same time. Y you're, you're saying you see several bars there. that here that have a strong posterior probability, like a posterior probability here. Yeah. Yes. So I would say that this happens when there's a single mass extinction event, and I, I would consider that as a single mass extinction event but we are not quite clear at which time it happened. It could have happened like at 25 million years ago, or 22 million years ago, or 27 million years ago, and because we are taking bins to estimate the probability that there was a mass extinction event in this time interval. Depending on how, how large I take these bins, I get different probabilities. And what we are doing here is we are just basically um, like before we're computing what is the prior probability that it was in that bin. And uh, what, what else you could also do is you could fix uh, an analysis where you say, I know that there was one mass extinction event. I just try to estimate the time of it. Or you could uh, say, I know that there was a mass extinction event and I want to test what uh, the model that the mass extinction event happened at, let's say, exactly 23 uh, million years ago. You could estimate base factors as we talked about on Monday directly, so directly fix these times and that there was the event versus a model where there was no event. Or you could also fix that mass extinction event and see if there truly was a mass extinction event, how do my diversification rates through time look? Because if there was one or was not one, has an impact on the diversification rate estimation. Yeah. How uh, does the analysis here to come up with mass extinction event not want to not necessarily mean the extinction event? Right. I think the best for that. So if we look at this figure here. And what we're seeing here on our simulation, where we have one mass extinction event with a survival probability of 0.15%. Uh, 
uh, point, yeah, point 0.15. That means we have this really long branches here, but then we really start rapidly diversifying uh, at this point in time, which could either be because there was a rate shift like here for having a higher speciation rate, so this is when we were reconstructing, or because there were a lot of lineages actually alive at this time, but then they all died, like 85% on average of those died here, and that's why you have these really long branches. And what we did with our simulation study, we showed that if a mass extinction event, for example, happens very close to the root, you can't really estimate it because there were probably just two or three species alive at that time, and maybe one or two survived, but that's not statistically enough power to do that. Um, so if it's somewhere in the middle of your phylogeny, that's where you would have the best power to estimate it. Um, but these are also just like first models that we have provided to really look at those mass extinction events. Th other things could be that maybe some species have different Prob uh, survival probabilities, or that uh, it's not quite, uh, yeah, not quite uniformly that uh, species are surviving mass extinction events. There are sort of um, violations of this process that uh, could also lead to slightly different patterns. No. Um, yes, so for example, here we have a very long branch, but this branch didn't result from a mass extinction event. It just A, resulted by chance, and B, because we had a high um, extinction rate, like background extinction rate in this time interval. Um, it is really the pattern that uh, the process tried to tease apart, that there are several really long branches that are going to the root this is sort of the signal. But single branches, um, if there's a single very long branch, um, under these models it wouldn't say necessarily that it's a mass extinction event. But this is why I meant maybe there was sort of a mass extinction event only affecting this group. So this is something we cannot do yet. Okay, so we have this tutorial. It was just maybe labeled differently. Um, well, we want to start with, uh, so as, as usual before, you have um, a lot of the theory explaining um, here, these are extinction events, speciation events, mass extinction events, really just for you mostly at home to read through it again to understand what the underlying theory is, what the methods are, assumptions behind the process, and so on. Also explaining to you how we condition on, for example, on survival of the process because the motivation is generally we only analyze phylogenies that survived until the present because otherwise we can't sequence them if there are no um, surviving species. Um, here's the background uh, and a little bit of intuition for the people who are more mathematically minded who want to see how we actually compute um, the probability of the tree. Um, then it says that here we're actually, in this tutorial, we're using the phylogenetic trees as observations, which is probably not the best idea, but for the sake of uh, doing that in a workshop, this is definitely what we have to do. Um, you can use all of these processes as a prior distribution on your time tree analysis as well to estimate then diversification rates um, through time or uh, lineage-specific diversification rates jointly while you're estimating your phylogenetic tree. Or we also have methods where you're reading in the entire posterior distribution of trees um, from the output from your previous analysis and in that sense taking into account all the uncertainty of uh, your, your phylogenetic trees to estimate those diversification rates. Okay, so here what we have is we, uh, for this tutorial, what we're using is a dated primate phylogeny with uh, 233 species. So that's a pretty large uh, primate phylogeny, but it's not, um, not the complete phylogenetic tree. Uh, not the complete phylogeny for primates. This is the graphical model for the uh, pure birth process where everything would be fixed. 
And this is then the, the example where we actually specify a log normal prior distribution on the speciation rate. So what we're going to do here is, let's use this one. So we can read in the trees just sort of in the same way as we read in um, the data. But one of the important parts is also that we are saying we just take the first tree. So even if there's just a single tree in your file, it always assumes that there's a vector of trees. So you always have to say, um, no, I'm just taking the first tree for this analysis. So I'm reading my tree. Um, and then I need to get the, the taxon information from my tree just the same way as we did before for, uh, because we need that uh, to specify that in the birth death process to tell it what are the different taxa that I used in that analysis. Then I'm estimate, uh, I'm setting up the indices for the moves and the monitors. So really the same thing as usual. And then I'm computing the what my expectation was that there should be 367 primates in total divided by uh, 2 divided by the root age of that tree. So that is the mean of the prior di uh, distribution that I'm using. I'm computing then the logarithm of that because I'm using a log normal distribution. So you always need to use the logarithm of your expected mean. So that's actually the median then for that um, uh, for the log normal distribution. And I'm specifying this value for the standard deviation, which basically is telling me that I use a prior distribution with one order of magnitude. Span, uh, yeah, my 95% prior interval spans exactly one order of magnitude. If you would take twice this value, it would span exactly two orders of magnitude. So that's why this weirdly looking number is actually kind of nice to use for log normal distributions. Um, the only thing, the only parameter that we're changing or that we have was the birth rate. And since the rate parameter, we are generally using a scale parameter, uh, a scaling move. So that move is again, um, yeah, just uh, proposing changes, scaling the current rate up or down. We are also specifying the sampling probability, saying the number of the tips that are currently in the tree divided by the total diversity of the group. So that is the sampling, the empirically known sampling probability. Why we're doing that instead of estimating it is because um, uh, those parameters, the speciation rate, the extinction rates, and the sampling probability under the uniform sampling approach are not identifiable. They're really not identifiable, and they are uh, correlated to one another. So you can do parameter transformations to get exactly the same likelihoods. Um, that is why we always fix the um, sampling probability. What, what you could do if you don't exactly know the sampling probability, maybe you could specify a very informative prior distribution and saying, well, my sampling probability was somewhere between 0.4 and 0.5 and use that. So then you're getting more uncertainty in your parameter estimates because they are correlated and you can't really identify them, but then you really narrowed it down and you're taking that uncertainty also into account, which would mean you just specify a prior distribution on that row parameter. And um, then because we always condition the tree on, yeah? the speciation and extinction rate. So if you have speciation rate, extinction rate, and sampling probability, only two of those three parameters are identifiable. That's what? When have the yes, that's when you have uniform sum. So here we're specifying that the root age or the root time is exactly to the time of the tree that we know. Um, in, in your previous analysis, when you estimated the trees, you put a prior on that one to on the age of the tree. But yes, since the tree, we were taking it as an observation in our birth death process, 
We do always need to specify what the time of the root is. And then this is our main function here of the birth death process. Um, here we are passing in lambda, that's the speciation rate. We're passing in mu here as well, so I'm doing that explicitly here, saying that the extinction rate is zero to show this is my pure birth process. I'm passing in the sampling probability, um, the root age. I pass in the sampling strategy. So here I can change the sampling strategy to diversified sampling. We have a different tutorial that goes more about the sampling um, that we are not going to do today. And then we condition and uh, condition the process on survival. That's what we usually do. You could also condition just on the time of the process that the process ran for a certain amount of time. Uh, that generally has no effect. That's just sort of the other default option. Or you could uh, condition your process on that you actually sampled exactly n species at the present. And then we pass in the taxon information that we're using to initialize the tree. Um, that's it. Yes. Well, the empirical sampling that I showed. Oh, which other sampling? The empirical sampling where I said there's 10 species missing in that group, so between that time interval, there's another 20 species missing in that group, so from that time interval, and so on. That would be the other biased sampling that we provide. If you have any other ideas of biased samplings, happy like to discuss that. I think the other one that we, I don't know if we have allowed that in the pre-compiled version that you have, or if that is currently still on a different branch, is when you would say that the sampling strategy is actually a mixture. And that's then a mixture between uniform taxon sampling and diversified taxon sampling. Uh, yeah, if you wanted to try that, just let me know. And um, I'm looking into that. And as I said, there um, is a tutorial. I can check if it's on our website as well. But um, the tutorial is uh, called the sampling tutorial and goes about uh, yeah, estimating diversification rates with missing taxa and has uh, a lot of the same introduction uh, just really the same template that we used um, and explains then a little bit the process through time, what we, we are going to do in the second part, um, but it then also um, talks a little bit, you see that this is not as much documented, but because that was just a repetition of the previous tutorial, then it really talks about the different samplings, like the uniform taxon sampling, um, where you get these results, where you look at diversified taxon sampling, um, and then finally at empirical taxon sampling, where you have these triangles and say how many species are missing. So that is also available if you want to try and go through this one. Okay. So we were at the point that we created all of our distributions. Now we just need to clamp, but this time again, the tree and not our sequences um, to uh, the birth death process to the time tree variable. And um, then we are basically done with our model. We are creating a model object and passing in any of our variables. So I take the birth rate. I specify the model monitor, and that's the only monitor that I need. I don't need a monitor monitoring trees because they are already known. Um, I specify my screen monitor. Um, then I'm setting up my MCMC. Run the MCMC, and you will see that here we are using larger number for the MCMC. But it's super fast, because that's a super simple model with a super simple likelihood to compute. So that's just going really quick through the 50,000 iterations. You could run it more, but that should be fine. Um, so there, there should be also the file, everything what I did in the mcmc underscore ul. 
and um, then we just want to look at what's the posterior distribution of the speciation rate, um, what the HPD is for that one, and then we want to estimate the prior, looking what's the difference between the prior, posterior, um, really seeing also if I would specify different priors, what effect that would have, how much information there's actually in that tree, um, and then going on to estimate the marginal like that under the pure birth model, and then estimating a birth death model and marginal like that, and then I see is a birth death model more supported than a pure birth model.